Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Being Brown and Bold podcast. I'm your host, Jess Thomas. We're so glad that you're joining us for all of our amazing conversations about stepping out of our comfort zone, being bold, and taking chances. Today, I get to hang out with Maya Kaimal, an entrepreneur and cookbook author who has been an early inspiration for the South Asian culinary field in the U.S. Raised in Boston, then Boulder, Maya's passion for food and cooking blossomed at a young age, from watching Julia Child's The French Chef with her mother Lorraine, to tasting her father Chandran's vibrant South Asian dishes, Maya's interest in food was piqued. Her curiosity in spice, taste, and cooking developed during trips to her father's home in Kerala as Maya learned to cook with her Kamala auntie. Maya worked at various magazines in New York, and she saw an extraordinary gap between what she grew up eating and what the Western palate thought Indian food was. One realization and three cookbooks later, Maya's desire to educate and create has not stopped. In 2003, Maya launched her namesake company with her husband Guy Lawson out of their Brooklyn apartment after seeing a lack of quality Indian products in grocery stores. With her collection of family recipes, she works to create convenient Indian food that tastes as good as homemade. Maya lives in upstate New York with her husband, twin daughters, and their noisy dog. So Maya, it is so great to have you here on the podcast today. Wow, thank you so much for having me. So to get started, tell us about your name, how to pronounce it, what it means. We, we think names have a lot to do with our identity in brown culture. So tell us about your name. Sure. Yeah. So, so Kaimal is a Malayali name, but it's not so common, but Kaimals are part of the Nair community, which is a very large Hindu community. And I guess there's like a whole sort of history to it. Kaimals were the royal guards to the Maharaja of Cochin and like there's a whole, whole story to it. It does baffle people in terms of the pronunciation a little bit. So all my life, I've I've heard many versions of it. For such a short name, it gets a lot of different interpretations. So it's it's I've heard Kamal, I've heard Kamal, I've heard Kamali. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's pretty simple, Kamal. Um, yeah. And my first name, my parents wanted to give us all Indian names. My mother is American, but they had three children and we all got Indian first names and then Western middle names so mm-hmm. that we choose if we wanted later in life to to change it so i'm maya ann kaimal <laughs> ah, my daughter's middle name is ann as well but part of that is like my mm. mom's name is Annama, ah. and my mother-in-law's name is annie and we're like okay we do ann yeah we're honoring everybody there you go yeah i don't know where mine came from it just was it just sort of fit i guess tell us a little bit about yourself, what does it mean to be Maya? Well, I guess it means uh, feeling a part of two cultures. I w- I feel like that was a very fortunate thing in my life. Never a confusing thing. I get to connect with two places, no family in two places. Uh, that's really kind of shaped my identity and my career, clearly. So I feel pretty comfortable in all that. But I would say, I mean, I'm much more American than I am Indian. I go to India and I feel like everyone can just tell in an instant that I'm American, <laughs> the way I smile or laugh or carry myself or dress or whatever it is. When you're in your family home in India, you feel like you belong. And we would spend a lot of time with family, of course, when we would take our trips there when I was growing up and still to this day. I mean, when I go to India, they also say I'm an American, even though both my parents are Malayali. But I don't know if it's like the way I carry myself or maybe I smile too much. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The big Um, American smile always gives us away. (laughs) Yeah. And my family is from Kerala and your dad's from there. Tell us a little bit more about that cultural heritage. And then also how that ended up informing your work and your life. My father um, was actually born in Kuala Lumpur in in Malaya because his father was a botanist who worked for a rubber institute in Malaya, that being a you know Malaysia now, but it was a big center for rubber production. So my father and my aunt were both born there. And then World War II broke out and the family went back to Kerala. 
So he grew up speaking some Malayalam, speaking some English, uh, speaking a lot of English. He went to Benares Hindu University, so he sort of left Kerala for university. But he really always felt like a Malayali. You know, that was never really a question, even though we're, it was sort of his um, like high school years that were mostly spent there. He came to the U.S., you know, graduate degree, ended up getting a Ph.D. at University of Washington and met my mother. And this is in like 1955. You know, and my mother was from New England. Um, Lorraine Augusta. She was from Boston originally. I mean, they met at a time when there weren't very many Indians in the U.S. at all. I mean, I recently looked up a census. The number of Indians in the U.S. when my dad came were like in the thousands, five, six thousand Indians in America. I mean, now it's four and a half million. They became um, very close to other Indians at the university, and those Indians were marrying American women too. And so they've formed this really tight community. They would get together for Thanksgiving for over 50 years. We got together with this. So that became sort of Indian, or my yeah. Indian family abroad. We would always go home to Kerala and, and, and many, and these other families, some were Malayali, some were Tamil, mostly South Indians though. The South Indian connection has been like super strong, even though none of my father's family actually ever lived here. I didn't hear Malayalam being spoken when I was growing up. I would just hear it when we would go back on our visits. So I, if you're going to ask me if I speak Malayalam, I'll just cut you off at the pass. And the answer is no. <laughs> Do you understand like a little bit of like home talk? Like, yeah, yeah. Like I, rice, and that kind of thing. Exactly. The food words I've got, you know, got a bunch of those down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spending hours in the kitchen with my aunt and my cousins. And yeah, you, you know, you pick that stuff up, but yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't function on my own though. <laughs> would they speak to you in Malayalam when you were in their house and it was just kind of like an immersion for you or would they switch because they, they knew would, that you. They, they And yeah, they would switch and you know, they speak English perfectly. Right? right. So it really wasn't like a struggle for anybody, but it was a switch, you know, and my dad, it would come out like half English, half Malayalam. So I could follow him perfectly. I'm curious. At the time they got married, that is before the Loving versus Virginia case mm -hmm. of um, I know. mixed marriages. So did they have any legal for them yeah. to get married? I know. Um, but it's no crazy. They, I know. <laughs> it is mind blowing. I thought about that. I I never got to ask them about that, but I will tell you that my mother, she was a very open minded person and reader and intellectual and curious about the world and loved my father's culture and history you want you know wanted to know about india and wanted to go to india she actually really reveled in anybody kind of looking askance at her walking around seattle with my dad and their brown baby you know my sister at the time she kind of liked that she was pushing boundaries talk about bold she wasn't brown yeah. she was bold yeah <laughs> she just felt like hey you know this is i've met my match and you know just deal with it <laughs> that's amazing especially women in general were kind of silenced back then as well so that she right. stood her own. And she chafed against all that. She was a, you know, feminist, you know, from early days. And she was, you know, she had strong opinions about, you know, what she should be able to do. So, yeah, she was pretty, pretty strong. I know a lot of people were introduced to Kerala culture from Abraham Burgess's book, The Covenant of Water. Did you oh get to read it? God. I read it like immediately when it first came out. I just, yeah. I just ate it up. I loved that book and I recommended it to everyone I could. Mm -hmm. And I, I listened to the audiobook, which was to me Same. even richer, right? Right. Because, because he's reading uh, it. His oh just the way he just speaks my Ellen so beautifully and and oh yeah you really it was more immersive for that. But I really did feel like I was walking in my, you know, my grandparents' footsteps because I've been to some of these ancestral homes. I recognized so many, so much of the architecture and settings. And so, yeah, what a what an amazing tale. It blew me away. So I'm looking for all the food references yeah, in there. I was like, oh, I can make that. Oh, yeah. I haven't made that in a while. I should do that. <laughs> Exactly. I'm like, I have a recipe for that. I gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was super fun too. I mean, we want to revisit all that stuff. Just those all oh, the when she makes that beef dish and it, just the cardamom and the 
clove and cinnamon. And I'm just like, oh, I need this right now. Yeah, because I don't cook Carola food very often. I did more so when we weren't empty nesting. But mm -hmm. then I wouldn't cook it maybe once a week or once every two weeks even. Yeah. So I'm just not used to eating it all the time. I mean, I did growing up in our house. We would eat it lunch and dinner like every day, which is why probably I was like, can I just have pizza? Can I just have nachos? Yeah. 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 Was too much of it. You know, that's something that really fascinates me. I, I love to ask Daisy's like, how often do you eat Indian food? How often do you make it? How often do you, you know, buy a product? Do you get it from a restaurant? Like really, really curious because there are a lot of options now besides making it from scratch and the make it from scratch has its pros and cons, obviously very time consuming, but very rewarding and connecting you like to your your family, depending on, you know, who handed that recipe down to you or what your memories are of it. Food's so emotional and evocative for us. And I'm very, very interested. I mean, obviously, partly because I have a food business, but also just because it's how we carry on that, that culinary legacy, right? It's like, how, what does it look like in a busy life with kids and you want them to feel some connection yeah, that's interesting to me that you make it once in a while. I'm curious. I know you're interviewing me, but I, <laughs> I want to ask. No, I'm happy to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Cooking it for your kids growing up, like, you know, did were you doing it partly because you just want to make sure they had those tastes in their mind and memory? And how did they feel about that? Yeah, when I was growing up, my mom told me, you should learn how to cook our food so you can get married. And you can cook for oh. your husband. And I was like, mm, no, thank you. He can either take me as I am or I'm not getting married. Like those are the options. So I was kind of <laughs> against it. But I grew up helping in the kitchen all the time. Like I would grate the coconut on like the old school Kerala coconut grater. <laughs> We're sitting on the floor. And then I would like roll out the puri that we would make. My parents left Kerala to go to Calcutta to do their schooling. So then what I always thought was all Kerala food, I didn't realize later, actually, some of the stuff they were making were not from Kerala. It was like from the North and things that they had learned. I just assumed it was all Kerala. They'd be like, come to the kitchen. Okay, like stir this. So I'm like roasting rice powder to make putto or what we call, I call it noodle uppum. It looks like noodles. They call it string oh, yeah. hoppers. And idiopum. Idiopum. That's yeah. what my family calls it. Um, so things like that. I would always be in the kitchen doing those things. But then when I went to college, I went to Boston at BU, and that was my first introduction to like a wide array of American food because of the cafeteria. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, I've never had turkey tartarzini or like all these other <laughs> foods or soup. <laughs> oh my God. Like, yeah. Other than a Campbell's can, I never had like soup. Then I think I thought for myself, I would just cook whatever I feel like eating. Well, then I met my husband who happens to be Malayali. And mm. his mom is an amazing cook. So then I was like, oh, I want to learn because he really likes it. Not because yeah. he, he's, and he's actually really easy. He'll eat anything. So that's why I learned from my mother-in-law, because by that point I was living in Illinois and I was learning from yeah. her. And so I would make it just because he liked it. I mean, I didn't dislike it. I just didn't want it every day. There was more I, of a reason, more compelling of a reason to make it. Right. And then my kids ended up having um, a palate that loved everything. So they would love the awesome. Carol food I'd make, but they'd also like the butter chicken I made. And they'd also like the jambalaya I made. So they just ate everything and loved all the flavors. And to this day, they're all in their 20s. They still crave that Kerala food because that's the one thing they don't really have access to. In like New York City area, especially like Queens, in some parts of like Chicago suburbs, some parts of like Dallas suburbs, they're like Kerala catering. Yeah. Like people uh -huh. go and do takeout where uh -huh. they do it bulk. So I've noticed my generation and younger, if they want that Kerala food, instead of cooking it, they will do that takeout. Mm -hmm. And so they will buy food. Like my sister-in-law will buy, go make the trek to the store an hour away and buy enough Kerala food to last like four or five days. And so uh -huh. one, she doesn't have to cook it. She knows it's reliable yep. and it makes everybody happy. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's a great solution. I find it so crazy that that the food of Carol hasn't made it more into the mainstream after, right. you know, all this time. It's just starting to appear on some of the menus and obviously 
Sema in New York City is getting super famous and Carol yeah. Carolyn food is is definitely a big part of it. So yeah, it's getting more exposure, but it just mm-hmm. feels like such a missed opportunity. Yeah. We're not capitalizing on that more in restaurants. Yeah. But anyway, it's starting. Yeah. It's, I think for me, like that has been such a driving force is just like starting back when I was, you know, working in my publishing jobs in New York City in the 80s and 90s and just knowing and wanting to cook my dad's recipe is just realizing how surprised everybody was like, this is Indian food. Oh my gosh. Right. You know, that it wasn't like the stuff, the sort of cheap buffets and things that they'd been exposed to. And I was just so puzzled. Like, why isn't anybody else doing this? How is it that that people don't know what Indian home cooking is like this, mm-hmm. that, that gap, that, that cultural gap has, you know, it persists today, although it's, it is, changing but that whole model of like this is what indian restaurants serve is so it's just crystallized you know in this culture it's like that's it that's that's you know that's a successful business you're not going out on a limb and trying something you're not sure you know whether people will like it or not you're giving people their their butter chicken because that's what they want so it's this reinforcing itself over and over again that like that's what Indian food is it takes like this chef culture to can change things where there's these people we admire and they're willing to take you know take the chance people are, are going to eat their food because what they're doing is exciting and so slow slow to change but yeah I I, I mean I, I, the whole gap between like what Americans are think Indian food is and what we think it is, is just, it's, there's still a gulf there. Yeah. And I think part of it too, is how do you define Indian food? That's like defining what's European food, right? Exactly. So if you asked an American, what is European food? They can't answer because they're like, well, what do you mean Italy? Do you mean Spain? And I feel like it's the same thing with India. Like what is Indian food? Is it Italy dosha? Is it pav bhaji? Is it yeah. uh, tundra chicken? It's hard. You can't get your arms around it, even as an Indian person. It's so multifaceted. And depending on where you're from, yes, that's the that's the stuff you know the best. And you may not even recognize some dishes that other people think you know, of as mainstays. So right. yeah, it's that's part of the barrier. Another barrier is the fact that there's really not a sugar component to it, whereas most other Asian cuisines have that it's just part of the flavor balance right it's you know yeah. it's in thai curries it's in sushi and sweet and sour pork it's you know it's in um you know vietnamese food. like it's 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 there and it's it's nice right yeah it tastes good <laughs> i love it in in you know in a thai curry it's like oh my god this i can just eat this forever but it's not in indian it's i mean you know of course except there for are- the chaya yeah. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's yes. definitely there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But, you know, it's as a sort of, you know, one of the main sort of flavor pillars, uh, South Asian food, or, you know, it's not big. It's not a big part of it. And right. it's there. It's the kind of easy love, right? It's just like, mm, I'll have more of that. But Indian, wonderful balance that people find, some people find challenging. So I think that that also prevents Americans from, going there is just like uh you know I've heard it's spicy when you were growing up did your dad cook Kerala food so yeah I mean kind of like you he cooked different things it wasn't just the food of Kerala he would spent some time in Lucknow Banaras and so he'd been exposed to all different foods and he just really you know remembered flavors right it's like oh that dish was amazing so he was cooking things and this was you know more of like a a weekend hobby of his right you know he was working full time my mom was a great cook and she was a curious cook and just like always experimenting with Japanese and French and Italian and Chinese so she cooked mostly but when he cooked he was pulling from his memory bank like what his favorite favorite dishes are so some of them were from Kerala I mean I definitely remember thornton avil chicken was like a pirlin was one dish I don't know if you know that one um, that, that's not from my part of Kerala so the first time I heard about it do you know the 
Kerala based restaurant in um, Chicago, Thutta. Oh, sure. Yeah, they're great. Like That's the first time I had, they, they do a pork perlin. I'm like, I don't know what a perlin is. And <laughs> I think this is the other thing. We don't necessarily have names for the food that our families cook. They just uh, cook it and it could and, be in the Thorin yeah. category, but anything could be a Thorin. Anything could be a yeah. Mir- Miracle Preti. Yeah. Um, and then we called anything saucy a curry. So right. curry just meant saucy in our house, but it's not like there were names necessarily for things. Right, right, right. We ate, let's see, you know, just like kima and biryani and raita, like standard classic dishes. And some of them were from Kerala, um, but some of them were just like North Indian favorites. So yeah, we kind of had a little bit of it all. My dad was very interested in fine tuning flavor, right? My whole family is like very analytical about a lot of things. And so food is just another thing to really get kind of, nerdy about like <laughs> yeah um but from an early age my dad would uh, not that early I would say it was probably more like a teenager um to 20s my dad would say you know come and taste this what do you think does it need more salt does it need more lemon like he helped train my palate mm-hmm. so that I really also could analyze like flavor and and when things were in balance and he would talk a lot about like why he put in this much cinnamon and clove and cardamom, you know, and, and he had theories about, I mean, he was a scientist, right? So he, like, it all had to be logical. There had to be, there'd be sense behind it. So what makes a North Indian curry, North Indian, what makes a South Indian curry, you know, it's like, okay, I get the fennel and more coriander down in the South and, you know, it's more cumin and cinnamon and clove, you know, I absorbed that and that helped me a lot. But as I was building this business about, you know, I fell back on all of those lessons of why you do what you do when you're making certain curries. You've had different jobs in your career. So when you were little, did you have thoughts of what you wanted to be when you grew up? Or did you have any difficulties in choosing a vocational Uh, path? Well, I was always interested in the visual arts. I mean, my parents took us to museums, sometimes, you know, dragged us to museums wherever we went and in India we were always sightseeing you know had to like hit different sites every time and you know Ajanta and Allura and Kadraho I was exposed to a lot of art growing up I I think I wanted to be a graphic designer like that Mm. was my my hope but when I but I also really loved photography Mm -hmm. so when I got out of college I had majored in photography and wanted to come to New York and I had the opportunity to interview for some jobs in New York City it was clear to me pretty pretty much right off the bat that like the people who got the graphic design jobs had gone to Parsons and you know School of Visual Arts and they'd like specifically been educated for that and Mm -hmm. just sort of slide into it straight out of college. Did you go to college in Boston? Um, no, I went to um, Pomona College, which is in California. It mm. was in um, Claremont, California. But my photography background, that was obviously also a big part of the magazine art department. And so I was able to assist the photo editor and eventually move up and become a photo editor myself. So I was like graphic design adjacent, but I didn't ever have those skills. I didn't get those skills. I still think about it. So I ended up in magazines. I love that sort of like play of like image text, like how they support each other to tell a story. And so magazines were a good fit for me. I really enjoyed what I was doing there. I had this simultaneous interest in cooking my dad's recipes and I started bringing them into the magazine, catering the production night dinners. You know, when they do late night closings of the magazine every two weeks, they needed it catered. So I, I started doing some of that and that was really fun. And people were responding with like such enthusiasm to home cooked Indian food that it got gave me confidence that there was a real, you know, literally an appetite for more Indian food among my colleagues. So, uh, so yeah, so that made me want to take these recipes that I was cooking for them, my dad's recipes, to see if I could get a cookbook published. So did you actually think about being a chef or opening a restaurant or having an official catering company then? I did. I did. After 
catering those dinners. I was like, oh, maybe I want to be a caterer. So I looked into it. It took about a minute to find out that it, the pay was horrible and the hours were worse. And I, <laughs> I didn't think that that actually was what I was cut out to do. Being a chef, having a restaurant, I mean, I'd worked in restaurants. I knew they were pretty, you know, grueling hours and the lifestyle was demanding. And I, I just kind of preferred a day job. The desire was there to be able to kind of spread more information, education, like excitement about Indian food and, and especially South Indian food. The impulse was there, but it, I would just knew it wasn't realistic. So doing a cookbook was a more viable way to kind of, you know, share what I cared about so much. So I did the, my first cookbook, Curried Favors, Family Recipes from South India. So that was taking all of my dad's recipes and then and then adding to that to sort of like fill it out, capturing a lot of the South Indian classics, as well as some of those North Indian dishes that we've grown up loving too. I got that publishing deal. It came out in 1996. It got a Julia Child Award. So that was very exciting. I kind of had those parallel paths going on the cookbook writing. Then I, you know, I wrote another one because there were so many Kerala recipes that didn't fit in the first book. So did a second one called Savoring the Spice Coast of India, which was all Kerala, all foods of Kerala. And not, not just my community, it was Hindus. It was also Christians and Muslims and Jews, like the whole, because of Kerala's wonderful diversity make sure that that all was represented so i spent a bunch of time in kerala and met a bunch of cooks home cooks and so that was really fun to work on so but all this while i'm doing magazine photo editing too so that's a lot well yeah I had two things i really cared about and was able to sort of, sort of figure it out yeah. so in your house growing up in mixed culture house did your mom really try and do more with indian culture as far as like raising you all or things that you brought yeah. into the home or was it more like a typical American household? My mother was really interested in making sure we were Indian too. She made Indian food. She cooked it. We had Indian sculptures around the house. We had Indian textiles everywhere. I mean, they really liked um, Danish modern furniture. So it was kind of like mid-century modern with Indian touches all over the place. Outside of the home, I felt like pretty much an American kid. There was a strong Indian flavor to uh, everything you know, in my home. In general, children are mean and will pick on you for anything. <laughs> Did you have any of that? Uh, like, do they even recognize that maybe you were tanner? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, it's that's an interesting question. I mean, I think my my older brother and sister got it a little more than me. Um, we were in Boston, right? So there was some mean words that that they got. I mean, I I didn't get as much of it. My friends were Italian, and then one was Syrian, and there were, you know, like it was a, a little bit of a mixture there too. When we moved to Boulder, I felt my brownness way more because. Boulder is a very, very homogeneously white community. Perhaps that's a bit different now, but certainly in the 80s and 90s, that was the case. It was sort of remarked upon there. You're so exotic, you know, kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just that sort of way. Not not put downy, just more like, oh, you're different, but mm -hmm. it's cool. <laughs> yeah. So, it is Boulder after all. Right. So, right. Um, oh, that's good. That yeah. wasn't a terrible experience. I know it's a lot of immigrant kids had it rough. I was lucky that that was not my situation. In fact, my friends would smell Indian food cooking in our house and ask if they could stay over. They were like, oh, oh it smells so good. Can we stay for dinner? Aww, that's <laughs> so, amazing. Yeah, it was more seen as a, a plus, not a minus. Whereas a lot of immigrant homes, like my peers, would be like, oh, the house always smells like any, my clothes smell like Indian food. I'm so oh. tired of, yeah, like putting certain clothes, keeping it in the car so it wouldn't be exposed to any spice yeah. aromas. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, I heard that a lot from peers. I get that that's what it's like for a lot of people. And for me, I, my mother was sort of doing most of the cooking and setting the tone as the, the homemaker, um, she did also work as an editor, but she was doing the running the house. We had 
we had sandwiches for lunch. Like, you know, it was on, of course, like some funky bread that she liked from a bakery that didn't look like other people's bread, but uh -huh. it was, you know, and she put halva in there and my friends would say like, is that, what is that? Is that an eraser? I, I had like not bologna sandwiches and, you know, chocolate chip cookies. I had like slightly unusual lunches. They weren't Indian food lunches. So I think, I think all of that has made me feel like I, both, I'm both an insider and an outsider yeah. of India. I can look at it from as an American, but also as someone who's very intimately fond of the, the place and the culture. And that affection has made me feel even stronger about like this idea of, of, of sharing the culture, launching the brand, leveraging Indian textiles and, you know, patterns and colors to represent India instead of seeing elephants and Taj Mahal on Indian packaging and thinking like, there's so much more to India than that. I love the color combinations and the way Indians, you know, walk around in hot pink and orange and lime green dhotis, you know, like the men are just wearing their work clothes are so bright. And that's such a wonderful kind of expression of the, the spirit of the place and the people that color is just like so integrated into their lives. By comparison, look at me today, I'm wearing like neutral <laughs> drab, <laughs> but I love India. And I think if I lived in India, I'd be saying different things right now because I know it's one thing to go as a tourist and another to be a part of it. And as a woman, you know, what, you know, what would that be like for me and what, what challenges would I be facing there? Looking at India as someone who hasn't had the lived experience, but who has had a strong connection and wants to try to close that gap of a perception of India and what more India has to offer. I love how you really feel like a global citizen, right? Not just American, just it, but like global mm. with your interests and you definitely sound like an artist like you you have an artist's heart <laughs> i suppose that's true the visual part of india i'm so excited by it. it's enriching for me to be there and to be part of that culture one of the things that i have found in south asia or actually most of the non-western world is spirituality as you have encountered different cultures, seeing your dad and his multicultural background, as far as like geography, he's moved around a lot and visiting mm -hmm. India. You've probably seen faith expressed differently. Even within Kerala, we see like a temple next to a mosque, next to, a, you know, it's all yeah. accepted and not seen as a, in Kerala specifically, not seen as a challenge, maybe other parts of India. For you personally, mm -hmm. has there been any faith or belief system that has informed your outlook in life? So my mother was raised Catholic and my father was raised Hindu. Uh, my mother was raised Catholic in Boston. So that was like a particularly like severe version. of Catholicism. <laughs> Yeah. But she really rebelled against. She felt that that was too controlling. So she pushed back against her religious upbringing. And my father was a, sort of a passive Hindu and there were no temples to go to in the U.S. back then. I think he would 100% always identify as, as a Hindu. So I didn't, I didn't see it in action at home, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel like he was very informed by a lot of the sort of central beliefs of Hinduism. And, and he was also a scientist. And so he was a very logical person. And so, it, you know, he took what suited him and came up with his own personal sort of philosophy. I was not raised religiously at all. We were kind of left to sort of find our own way. I think I've probably absorbed that outlook of, you know, you can't really control the outcome. So <laughs> stay calm, <laughs> you know, yeah. just a sort of more laid back outlook on life. Okay. So you started this company. Did you think when you were little growing up that you would be an entrepreneur? Oh, gosh. No, never, never. You know, my father was a civil servant. He worked for the government. He worked for NOAA, the no, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. He was a distinguished scientist there. We were always led to see ourselves in a job, 
right? <laughs> there was nothing entrepreneurial in my upbringing. I was looking for a path that would keep me employed. You know, I chose publishing and saw myself continuing on in that as long as possible. Little did I know that publishing would just dissolve <laughs> during yeah. my time there. Had I not gotten laid off at the time I did, which was just after getting married to my husband, who was more entrepreneurial than me and uh -huh. is, he was a journalist and you know self-employed. Had we not had the entrepreneurial circle of friends that my husband knew who had started businesses and talked to me about like, you know, you could start a business if you wanted and you could do something in Indian food if you wanted. So I think all those sort of ingredients were there and led me to have the confidence to take a chance on starting a business. I would never have done it without my husband just because of his strong belief that this was something that would work and that he would support and that I, you know, because I didn't have a job, right? So what was that? How, how do you start, you know, when you have no income? So he right. did, he supported it in every sense, right? Financially, emotionally, he had a law degree so he could read the contracts and help me negotiate things. So a lot of elements kind of lined up that, of course, what I've talked about, which is this urge to educate, this desire to bring a different perspective on India and especially Indian food to Americans. So this here was the opportunity. And the timing just turned out to be incredibly good because there wasn't anything. I mean, the only thing there was like, you know, a couple of imported brands. It was such a kind of sad sack part of this grocery store who wanted to go to that part you know it was all dusty and nothing looked exciting nothing was being marketed to americans and to right. me that was such a huge miss it was sort of more going for that like real ethnic appeal and some people find that appealing some americans feel like they're getting the real thing right when they're like getting something that's like looks like it's from the old world but you know it didn't it didn't seem to be saying to people hey this is gonna help your life this is gonna solve your dinner conundrum this is gonna you know like this is easy and this is really flavorful i i really noticed how much wasn't being done. No, nobody was doing anything. And it really baffled me. Like, why has no one stepped into the breach here? I think that the American audience was there once we came out with it. If you want to talk about like being bold, we went out with a refrigerated Indian sauce. Like we, wow. were, we were going into new territory for Indian food <laughs> because I yeah. didn't want to be in that dusty part of the store. Right. I didn't, who no one's going to find me there. So I thought, okay, go where the people are all going. You know, they call that the perimeter of the store, right? You know, right. The, the, the edge with all the refrigerated things that are exciting and the pestos are there and the nice cheese is there. I was encouraged by someone in the food industry, like maybe try a fresh version. I was like, okay, that sounds good because then I can really just make it like homemade and it can taste like I made it from scratch. So yeah. That was the way we started. And that's kind of how we established the brand as like a premium brand. And it it um, did really well for many years, but eventually going to the shelf stable version of my product made more sense for scaling the business. Not every store has room for refrigerated Indian food. The global aisle was starting to grow and get some traction. And so there was room to grow in there. Well, it's neat to see your products on the shelves. I'm like, she follows me on Instagram. I know her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I love what you're doing. Oh. I love conversations around uh, being Daisy and being in America and, you know, finding the places to live out your culture and what does that feel like and, and where do you find community? What is it like to be Indian in the U.S. now? I mean, it's such an evolving thing. And there's, you know, four and a half million different versions of that. It's a great conversation to have. Because we live in Tennessee, we've been here 24 years. And here, the culture is pretty homogenous, the people groups here. So they don't have exposure even to good. I think there was one Indian buffet when we first moved not here. We live in a tiny town of 2000, like an hour away. 
And so people really did not know anything about Indian food. I became a personal chef and I actually didn't cook Indian food unless it was requested. And then in the past few years, I've done private dinners. For example, there's a book club that read Come Into Water. And they're like, Mm. we want that food. I was like, oh, I would love to do that food for Uh, you. And they loved it. And it's nothing like they've eaten at an Indian restaurant anywhere around here. And then I do chai classes. So I teach about Indian culture through chai because people like pumpkin spice latte and chai tea lattes. I'm like, (laughs) okay, so you have some introduction to spices. It's not quite correct. So then I do these classes and I have them smell the spices and teach them how to grind it and make their own blend of whatever they, masala they like. So it's been fun and interesting to do that here because at least if you're in a more metropolitan area, you have the ability to be exposed to those things, but here there's like zero. So it's been a fun adventure. Yeah. When I was a personal chef, I would cook on the local TV station and do uh-huh. my little you know five minute demo and during pandemic, I did like Carol of fish curry. I did Thorin. I did Mora curry. I was mm-hmm. like, they don't care what I make. And nobody watches those demos to cook. That's why they go to Food Network or the internet. So let me just use this at a, as an education platform. And it was so fun to be able to be like, here, uh-huh. this is what my family's food is like. So yeah, it's been a great mm-hmm. fun adventure for me. Yeah, no, you'd be a great spokesperson for, I'm sure. (laughs) One of the things that I have found in our Malayali culture that shows your identity in being Malayali is owning a curry leaf plant. Do you (laughs) own a curry leaf plant? Oh my God, I tried and I failed miserably. So I guess that makes me a a bad Malayali. (laughs) Oh, no, it's not. It is... A uh, skill that takes a while and different people I've asked in the podcast have given different tips. The best tip I ever got is when you get your plant, if it starts looking sad in the winter and spider mates and all that, you just yeah. strip off every single branch except the main one and it will come back. And I've oh. done it two years in a row now and it has come back. And in the summertime, I put it outside. I have um, Margaret Pack, who's in uh, yeah. Chicago yeah. with Tata. Yeah. She takes hers into the shower and with the steamy water, we'll give it like a tropical oh, mist. I love that. Yes. So <laughs> you can do it. It's just, you have oh, to start okay. it and then put trust in it. Mm-hmm. Um, Chef Vijay Kumar from yeah. uh, Sema, yeah. I just gifted him one because I went to visit my parents and they always have little baby sprouty ones. And so they had nurtured one and I was like, can I gift this? They're like, oh yeah. And so I had told Chef Vijay that I would and I brought it and then he was like, I have, I have to work really hard to keep this alive. <laughs> so I think all of us get that nervousness in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so if you ever get one, let me know and I will give you all the curry leaf tips. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. It's good to know if I'm feeling really courageous again, I will. <laughs> what is your go-to beverage? Would you choose chaya, tea, filter copy, limka, mango lessi? Like what's your like treat or your go-to? Yeah, um, definitely tea. And really, I use a British tea, like a nice, strong British tea. Um, My favorite brand is Yorkshire Gold. And it's just, you know, it's kind of like PG tips, but I like it better. I think it's like a little better quality with milk and sugar, of course. Yes. (laughs) And I have it, yep, every morning and every afternoon at three o'clock. So, Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. You're very disciplined. Most people, because I teach chai classes, they assume that's my favorite, but it's actually what you just said. I want like dark black tea, but then I want sugar in the raw and I want cold milk in there. Yeah. That, that's my treat. <laughs> the, just the right hit of caffeine for me. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, just the right like sweetness. So mm, my favorite. You've shared different stories about being bold. Is there something you would like listeners to know if they are hesitant about making a bold move. You can't be afraid of failure. I mean, you find out that, you know, people who we think of as great successes have had so many flops too. The fact that we remember successes is just a trick of the mind. (laughs) It's really important to allow yourself to have the misses and learn from those. That's how we grow. You got to take chances and you just have to be 
okay with the outcome because it's going to make you smarter and help you get where you're going. Having those experiences makes you resilient so that you can continue to walk in boldness. And I see you continuing to evolve the business and it's growing. It's not stagnant or it doesn't sound like it's fine. Like I see you being more innovative and it's great. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, you gotta, you have to keep growing. You just have to, sometimes it works out better than other times, but the process is it's a path. It's a journey, right? It's all an important part of the journey. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Maya, for joining me. This has been a wonderful conversation. I'm so glad I got to know you a little better. And then just the listeners hearing your story, because you've been in just your product is over 20 years old, which is amazing. Oh, crazy. But yeah, well, uh, thank you so much for having me on, Jess. It's really been fun to talk to you about all the parts, everything that's gone into getting where I am.